Hi everybody, my name is Paul and I'm a clinical psychologist based at Dubai Community Health Center. Um, so I specialize in child and adolescent development and mental health. So I work with uh, children really from the ages of three upwards and um, with a range of, of developmental difficulties and mental health concerns. So some might come to the clinic for assessment of things like ADHD, autism, uh, developmental difficulties, things like dyslexia. Um, and I also support children, teens and adults as well with mental health difficulties like anxiety, uh, low mood, emotion regulation problems. So it's quite a varied and mixed role, but I think that's, that's the beauty in it. So today I'm going to talk a bit about the, the return to school and some of the anxiety related to that. Um, and I will talk about different topics within this. So things like managing your own anxiety as a mom, um, how to manage our children's anxieties, but also just how to maintain family resilience a little bit um, as we move through this period of time. So I would like to start by talking to you about how you can manage your own anxiety as a parent and as a mom. Um, and research by Psychology Today has assessed some of the concerns that mums have about their children going back to school. And obviously there are a range of different worries and fears that some parents have. Um, and some are worried about, you know, so, like for example, children becoming sick by going back to school. Some are concerned that they're making the wrong decision. Some are worried about their children getting the right support if they have additional needs. So I think what I want to outline, first of all, is that a lot of people are worried right now um, and they may not be concerned about the same things, but I think that most people are in the same position um, of worry and anxiety at the moment. And I think that's, you know, it's important to acknowledge that first of all. One of the things I would like you to look at on this slide is just this graphic here. Um, because really, historically speaking, we used to kind of view mental health as a two-state process whereby somebody was either mentally healthy and well or they were mentally ill and there was kind of nothing in between but actually our understanding now of mental health is much more fluid and it seems to be much more on a continuum so you'll see the left for example that it refers to people who are struggling or have difficulties with their mental health Whereas on this side, this is people who are thriving, engaged, and happy. And I think for most of us, we kind of move along different colors of the continuum throughout our lives and at different times of the year. And I think in the current circumstances, most of us have shifted slightly to the left with all of the stress and the worry and anxiety and the pressure um, that we've had throughout the year. But I think this helps to normalize the discussion about mental health and having conversations about mental health, which really is key moving forward. So for any parents or moms who, who are experiencing difficulties, what I would always say is start with yourself within the family. Um, think of the, the metaphor in the airplane where you should always fit your oxygen mask first before helping other people um, and apply that to your own health and well-being as well. If you're, if you're in a mentally healthy place, you're much more likely to be able to support the family. Um, and that's what I would recommend always. Another thing that I have shown a lot of moms and parents across COVID-19 is something called the circle of concern and the circle of influence. So this is, um, this is a concept devised by Stephen Covey, who wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And this talks about the circle of concern, which is like the blue area. And these are the things that we don't really have control over most of the time. So it's very hard to control other people's behavior. We can't really control the economy. We don't have a lot of control over, you know, social media or coronavirus. But actually inside the circle is the circle of influence. So this is the things that we do have control over and things that actually we may not fully believe that we have, but we actually have much more control over these things than we think. So we can obviously choose like our own attitude, who we spend time with, what we post on social media or who we follow. And um, we can control how much news we watch or how much TV we expose ourselves to. 
And as I, as I have explained this uh, concept to a lot of people in current times, this has really helped them to kind of shift their perception of like how things are going currently, but also like how much control do we have right now, um, which is what has been causing people some stress. So the first step to managing your own anxiety as a mom is to be aware of the signs or the symptoms of anxiety. Anxiety generally is this feeling of despair or worry um, or fear or a general kind of unsettlement that something bad is going to happen. So this can present in many different ways for most of us. So some people might notice that they are more comfortable. You will notice that they become withdrawn socially. A lot of people might have sleep problems and others might have poor concentration or problem making decisions. So really like there's lots of different signs of anxiety or symptoms of anxiety. And what I would say is that, you know, all of these experiences right now are appropriate and valid. And I think it's, it's good to note that actually a lot of people react differently to anxiety and that's okay. Um, and I think it's important to note that no two people are responding to the current circumstances in the same way. And that's perfectly fine too. And I think if we can accept that, we're much more likely to be in a better space um, with people around us. So this is just a visual to show some of the mums like what the, the symptoms of anxiety can be. Because um, some of them might be less well known than others. So things like constantly worrying, you know, looking for reassurance. A lot of people might have stomach issues or butterflies or a nervous feeling in the stomach. Obviously, people have insomnia and sleep problems, fast heart rate, or finding yourself overthinking a lot. So this is just to help people's perception of the symptoms of anxiety, because they may actually have some of these symptoms and not have realized that they're actually signs of anxiety as well. So it's important for the mums to recognize that really worry will always find its way to the worst case scenario. And if you're thinking about your children returning to school, and you find that you're more of a worried disposition, you're much more likely to find your brain spiraling and spiraling to something very dramatic. And I think remembering this is a great way to, to kind of to keep your mind a little bit more healthy. Because when we are worried, we are continuously thinking about possible future negative outcomes. So our mind is very future focused. And a lot of the things that help us when we get worried is to actually bring ourselves back to the present moment um, and to focus our attention on the present moment. So if you think about example on the left, this is just an everyday worry that somebody has left the iron on at home and then it spirals, what if it starts a fire? What if my cat dies in the fire? What if my house burns down? What if my insurance is out of date? What if I'm homeless? And obviously, this is quite a dramatic example, but this is exactly how worry works for some people, especially people who are more likely to worry. Um, and I think if you can know this and be aware of this in your own mind, you're much more likely to stop yourself getting right to the top. Um, so what I would like to do is just kind of introduce people to some of the things that can help us to bring us back to the present moment, um, which is a key part of therapy and a key way to manage anxiety. And if people notice that their mind is preoccupied in worries or they find that they're overthinking or they can't really focus or, or bring themselves back to relax, a great technique is the five senses. So in this one, you have to find yourself a really safe, comfortable space. You have to, you know, sit down and relax for a few moments. And then you need to spend some time looking around you and noticing five things that you can see, then four things that you can touch, three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and one thing that you can taste in your environment. And this is a really nice five minute exercise that helps people to bring their mind out of their worries and back into the present moment. Um, and that's a key way to manage worries or to manage overthinking. Other examples, of course, include things like progressive muscle relaxation. So this is also like a five minute exercise where you go through different parts of the body and deliberately tense your muscles and then relax them in different areas. Um, and it's quite a nice way to, to, to manage anxiety too. 
controlled breathing and box breathing. There's some really nice exercises on YouTube if people want to give them a try. And some of them, again, only take a few minutes. Um, there's excellent apps at the moment for, for people who need to manage worry and stress. Headspace and Calm and Aura are very popular ones. And there's loads of different daily exercises and activities that you can do in order to try to manage stress on, on the apps. And I would definitely recommend some of the mums to, to download these, you know, use their free trials, see if there's specific techniques that work for them or that help them when they're anxious. Um, Mind Shift is another one, and this is probably a step up from an everyday one where it's a bit like a very low level therapy. Um, but it's free as well, and it's got lots of, of resources for anxiety, worry, and panic. And one thing I often say to clients in therapy is that in order to use these strategies for anxiety, you need to practice them as much as possible when you're feeling calm or when you're relaxed. Um, it's a bit like you know your driving test. You don't immediately just turn up at the driving test and hope that you'll pass. You, know, you take lessons, you practice every week. So that when you actually have the test or have the anxiety, you can use the strategies that you've practiced. Um, so the practice of the strategies is essential, um, especially when you're calm and relaxed, so that when you feel anxious, you can then use the strategies that you've learned. So I just want to talk about some of the main concerns that have, that have come up from the research in psychology today. So, for example, a very, very common one is that my child could become sick by going back to school. Um, and I was looking at some of the, the evidence from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And really, they kind of responded to this worry of parents and said that, you know, children are much, much lower um, risk for contracting COVID-19 compared to adults. And even those who do don't become as sick as much as adults. Most are very mild or no symptoms at all, and the hospitalization rates are much lower for, for children than adults. Um, and I know that still this is quite a, a scary prospect, but I think that if some parents kind of keep this in mind, it does help to put things in perspective a little bit um, and helps anxious thoughts from, from taking over. And of course, if it still feels too much, then hopefully, you know, mums have, have chosen the, the distance learning option in this case. Um, and hopefully that has been an option for all of the people here today. A lot of mums are worried that they're making the wrong decision. And, um, you know, if I send my child to school, are they then at risk? If they're at home, are they being isolated by not being with their friends or their peers? And understandably, this has been a difficult decision for, for people. So hopefully people reflected on, like, how did your child cope with distance learning? How did you as a mom manage this? And um, what are the practicalities? You know, are you working? Have you other children that you need to, to take into consideration? Um, and I think really, for any of the parents that I've spoken to that are worried that they've made the wrong decision, I've just reminded them that, you know, there are pros and cons to both options, really. Um, whether that's home learning or actually going to school. And I would just say that, you know, in most cases, parents have made the best decision possible, given what they know at the moment. So hopefully parents aren't um, going over in their minds too much about whether they've made the right decision. And hopefully this will give them a little bit of peace about that. So, so I'm just checking the chat because I have notifications, but there's nothing there for me to, to look into. Um, some other parents have been concerned about their children with additional needs, not, in get, not getting the right support. And I think in this case, what I would say is always discuss the concerns with the school head of inclusion or the central. You can, of course, ask guidance on you know, how much support your child needs, how long they should be doing school work, because this will vary if your child has lots of additional needs. Where can they be independent, or where do they need the one-to-one -one support? Um, and how can, you, how can you meet their IED targets or support them at home is a key thing. I think it's very, very likely that you know, some of the restrictions at the moment will impact the level of support that children have if they need additional help. Um, and I think just being mindful that hopefully this is only a temporary thing and that any progress is still progress in the right direction will, will reassure some of those parents who are concerned. 
Other mums are worried that their children are going to suffer socially or emotionally um, with distance learning or by the restrictions within schools, even though their kids have gone back to school. Um, and I think, of course, this, this really depends on the individual child. Think of your child if you are worried about them. What do they usually need socially? Um, how have they coped without the social contact or with the reduced social contact? Um, are they fine just with occasional meetups or do they actually need like the regular social contact? Um, and I would use that as your guidance to think a bit about, you know, what support is needed. And if that's not being met by the return to school or if your child is distance learning, think of the ways that you can get them um, involved in social contact, you know, either, you know, with play dates or distance and um, park dates or even things like, um, you know, FaceTime or Zoom meetups with some of their peers just so that they can have a little bit of contact if possible. Some of the other ways that we can manage anxiety in the current time as parents is to challenge our unhelpful thinking. And these are more specific therapy techniques that I just want to introduce people to. So one is like a worry time or a worry space. And this is when we specifically allocate um, a certain time of the day or a certain space at home where we're allowing ourselves to worry. Um, and this can be like for 30 minutes in the morning or in a certain location within the home. And anything outside that space or time, you're not allowed to worry. Everything has to be kept for the next day and within the worry period. And this is a really useful technique for people. Um, but they have to be very explicit in, okay, my 30 minutes are in the morning from 9 to 9.30. After that, everything is saved to the next day. Um, and that's quite a nice technique for just putting a cap or a limit on the worries. Mm -hmm. Another one is the, the worry tree. So this is more like a problem-solving strategy used for, for people who find themselves worrying quite a lot. Um, so, of course, you start right at the bottom of the tree to notice what the worry is. Ask yourself specifically, what am I worried about? And then can I do something about it? And if the answer is no, then you really have to get into the habit of letting the worry go and changing your focus of attention. And this is where the, the present moment techniques come in in the previous slide that I mentioned. And if the answer is yes, then you have to devise an action plan. So stop sitting with the worry and change it to action. Like what can I do about this? When can I do it and how can I do it? And if it's now, then you have to do it. Take the action and then change your attention. And if it's later, then you need to make a plan for it and change your attention to let the worry go. So in all of these branches, whether it's yes or no, whether it's later or now, you still have to get into the habit of removing your attention from the worry. And that's where I mentioned the present moment strategies like before. Um, so this is quite a nice one that people use as well. And I think it's nice in the sense that it's visual and it brings you up the tree into different areas, depending on what you're concerned about. Some of the other techniques within therapy um, to challenge our unhelpful thinking includes just being more mindful of unhelpful thinking styles. So in therapy, we teach our clients like that most of us engage in a certain number of unhelpful thinking styles that research has identified for, you know, for psychologists. So this is only three of them, but there's maybe 12 to 15 different styles that have been identified. And one of them, for example, is called all or nothing thinking. So this is the type of worry or thought that kind of has two extremes and nothing in the middle. So something is either absolutely perfect or else it's a disaster, or it was amazing and if it wasn't amazing, it was really awful. Like there's no in between. Um, so a bit like if, you know, if I don't do it right, there's no point in doing it at all. So this is called, you know, all or nothing or black and white thinking. And this is a really common thinking style that most of us get into from time to time. Another one, for example, is jumping to conclusions. And this is when we immediately jump to an outcome without really thinking about the full evidence. So we can do this, whether it's assuming what we know another person is thinking or believing, and that's called mind reading. Or another one is fortune telling or predicting the future. Like I just know it's gonna be a disaster or I know it's gonna be terrible. Um, and these are very common thinking styles that most of us get into um, when we feel anxious or worried. 
So these are just things to be more aware of. And I can share a, a graphic with, um, with the Mums World team at the end if, they want, if there are people here who want more information on these styles, because this is just kind of a snapshot of what they are. Another thing that we do is called balanced thinking. And this is not just positive thinking. So it's not think positive and everything will be fine. It's about trying to look at the various different perspectives that can be had on a specific issue and making sure that you consider all the different possibilities um, and then creating a balanced summary um, or a balanced perspective on how things are. Because most of us have an anxious thought and immediately run with that anxious thought and think about all the possibilities because of that without actually thinking, how can I look at this differently? What would a friend say to me? Um, am I you know, considering all the evidence? Am I ignoring some evidence? And that's what balanced thinking is about, just to kind of open your mind a little bit, especially when you do feel anxious. Other therapy techniques can include tackling some of our unhelpful behavior. So when we're anxious, avoidance is like the classic response. Another way that we would challenge um, anxiety or worries within therapy is to think a bit about unhelpful behavior. So in anxiety, avoidance is a very common response. And if you think about the example of somebody who's afraid of spiders or afraid of mice, when we see one, our immediate reaction is to run the other way, to get away from it as much as possible. Um, and this is what avoidance is. Um, it's a very natural reaction to anxiety. It's a very common thing. Um, I did it for years because I used to be afraid of elevators. So I would never get into one. I would always take the stairs. And obviously, you can't live like that when you live in Dubai. But avoidance is a very common thing when we're anxious. Um, and it's fine in the short term because we don't have to face our fear. Um, it keeps us safe and away from stress. But actually, in the long term, the problem stays there. Um, so a classic example would be children who are refusing to go to school. They're refusing to go because they're probably anxious or worried and their refusal is avoidance. Um, and this is a key thing that we try to help people with in therapy. So think a bit about your own anxiety. If there is some avoidance there, are there ways you can kind of face it a little bit in steps? Um, and just take your time and try to face the fear a little bit at a time, if possible. Another one is reassurance seeking. A lot of people who are anxious seek lots of reassurance. And this can be like, asking lots of questions and doing lots of research about coronavirus and going back to schools, checking the news quite frequently, you know, constantly checking temperatures of family members or using and overusing hand sanitizers. Um, and again, it's fine in the short term and quite helpful, but it can often get out of control. So just be mindful of that if you do think that this is happening for you. But I think really what I want the mums to remember is that, you know, the schools have been very carefully directed by the government on certain steps that have to be taken about children going back to school. And this will be reviewed, of course. So things like, you know, risk assessments have been conducted within schools. They're obviously doing temperature checks. The number of people is restricted. Everybody has to be distanced. There's separate ent entrances. There's staggered start and finish times. And I know the mums know these already, but I think we're, we're almost so used to these things now that we forget that these things weren't here before. Like these are all steps taken to try to keep everybody safe. Um, and also like very basic things will keep us safe. If basic things like washing our hands will keep us safe. Um, and I think that it's important just to keep these things in mind, especially when we're anxious. And of course, talk to teachers if you're worried and get extra help if you need it. And I put a slide about that you know, coming later in, in the webinar. So the second kind of half of what I wanna talk about is just how to manage children's anxiety at the current times. Because this is a massive, um, a massive year for children in terms of changes and new rules and different boundaries and their environments have changed so much. So I think it's important you know, as parents just to be mindful of children's anxiety um, and how, how we can better manage that, you know, as best possible in the current times. So of course, like before, it's always important to be aware of the signs of anxiety in children. And children are very unlikely to say, mom, I think I've got anxiety, or mom, I feel anxious. But they're much more likely to say, mom, I've got a tummy ache, mom, I've got butterflies in my belly, 
mum, I've got a headache or I feel sick. We know from research that children are much more likely to report physical symptoms of anxiety before anything else. So just be aware of that and be mindful if your child is, is you know, reporting physical symptoms more, more than they normally would. Because um, that could be a sign that they're feeling a bit anxious. And this could be a nice thing just to have even on your phone or on the fridge at home, just to, if, if your child is anxious, they can point to it or they can highlight it and they can say, you know, what they think is, is applicable to them. Um, and I think it's a nice way just to kind of think about how the symptoms of anxiety in children are different than they, they are for adults in some ways. But of course, adults can get all these symptoms as well. So for all mums, I would say just be as open as possible. Talk to your child about stress and worry and anxiety. And I've told all parents to use COVID-19 as a great opportunity to talk to children about emotions and about mental health. And I think that's the one positive that has come from COVID-19. So many more people are talking about mental health and talking about anxiety. Um, and I think that's been a great thing. So. I would encourage the mums to acknowledge two things with their children. First of all, point out to them that a lot of people are anxious at the moment and that their children are not the only ones and that it's okay that a lot of people are anxious. And secondly, that it is okay if the future is not completely certain in every which way. Because anxiety loves uncertainty. And when things are uncertain, we are much more likely to feel anxious. So. If we can just get into the mindset of accepting that things ahead can be uncertain at times, then we're much less likely to feel anxious about that actually happening. Another thing I would encourage is acceptance of emotions. I think in times like this, you know, it's, it's good to remember that if children are responding or acting with very extreme emotional reactions, it's probably not because they enjoy feeling, you know, these extreme reactions. Um, and in that sense, I think it's good to remember that most children don't, don't deliberately behave like this or, or, or engage in these behaviours. Um, and sometimes it's very normal for children to yell or sulk or to hit their siblings or peers when they do feel stressed. And of course, although this is draining, I think it's, it's crucial to accept that this is sometimes what happens. And I always tell parents in my work that you should never, ever punish the emotion itself. So for example, if a child is feeling angry and hits their brother or sister because they're angry, and a lot of parents automatically say, you shouldn't get angry like that, or you shouldn't you know, show your anger like that. Um, and really like the key thing to acknowledge in this part is that it is okay to be angry or to be anxious or to be stressed. The emotion itself is acceptable and it's perfectly okay to feel this way. Because um, we don't want to say that any emotions are not okay, but the action when we feel the emotion is not okay. So it's not okay to hit your sibling when you're angry or to slam the door or to throw a toy when you're angry. So the action itself is the bit that's the problem, not the emotion. And I think distinguishing between the two is a key thing as a parent um, when we're managing our children's emotions, especially at times like this when so many of us are feeling a bit more emotional. Obviously, there are different ways that you can keep the momentum going if your child is back at school and they're, they're kind of, you know, doing okay. Um, and if there are some things that kind of crop up that make people feel a bit anxious, help the children to think about what are the things that they can control, like the, the circle of concern and the circle of influence that I spoke about. We can apply this to children as well. Obviously, make sure the basics are there, like good sleep, physical activity, and good food. Um, let the children do things they enjoy, whether it's reading, playing outside, or other activities. And I know that a lot of moms I've spoken to have noticed their children using iPads and tablets much more um, in the current times. And although this is not ideal in normal circumstances, I think, you know, especially in the Middle East summer, um, obviously help older children to kind of foster their sense of responsibility and remind them that you know they have actually been a great help and that they're helping the community and if your child like I mentioned earlier does need time to socialize then try to set that up with um, with phone or video chats if you can teach your child breathing exercises that they can do 
So there are children's version of the five senses, like I spoke about before. And this is a really nice way to, to teach children to relax and to calm down. And loads of the children that I work with love this, this um, exercise. And again, it really only takes five to 10 minutes. Some mums I know have sent little encouragement notes in their children's lunchbox just so that they, the children open their lunch and realize their mum's still thinking about them. Um, especially if they are anxious about going to school. Help them to remember the safety measures um, and some of the positives of going back to school. Um, and also use positive self-talk. So I don't know if you can see the visual on the right of the, the screen. Um, so these are just some of the ways that we can replace negative or panic thinking or worried thoughts with, with more positive ones. So I'm not good at this changes to what am I missing or this is too hard instead you can think this may take some time and some effort but hopefully I'll get there or I made a mistake mistakes are actually okay and it's part of learning and it's very normal and acceptable to make mistakes and um, so this is available online it's good to print it out you know have it at their study desk or on the fridge um, and just if you notice your child saying some of these thoughts on the left like all of us do from time to time then just immediately replace it with the, one of these, just so they can get into the habit of just replacing any negative self-talk with more positive self-talk. And of course, encourage the flexibility as much as possible. I think if one thing this year has taught us is that, you know, we really have to be flexible to change. Even, you know, the changes that have been there have not stayed and they've continuously been adapted or adjusted and you know, really, if we can be as flexible as possible, that's, that's a good thing moving forward. And I think it's good to help children embrace this as well. Another thing I often tell parents is to communicate regularly with children, especially if they are anxious. Listen to their worries and listen seriously, whether it's about a new teacher or more homework or their new class or school. And instead of dismissing fears, which is what we often do as adults, such as, you know, there's nothing to worry about or you'll be fine, don't worry. I think instead it's good to just listen and acknowledge the child's feelings and actually listen to what they're saying. I often tell parents as well, children don't always expect us to be able to fix the problem. And instead it's good to validate their feelings and just accept, actually, I know you're feeling really stressed at the minute, you're feeling really anxious. Um, but demonstrate confidence that they can handle what's coming or handle what's ahead of them. And that's a key thing for kids, um, is believing that their parents have belief in them. Um, coping plans also work quite well. So helping children to identify exactly what their worries are, making sure they've got fact-based information. So be mindful of some of the information that's in social media, because um, a lot of it's very inaccurate. Um, especially with returning to school and some of the, the regulations and even like with the COVID-19 facts and figures as well. Um, obviously encourage children to take coping breaks as well when they feel anxious. So a bit like what I said for the parents, so anything like deep breathing, even doodling or artwork, counting to a certain number. Some children work really well if they're, they're told, okay, let's count backwards from 100 in fours um, or something like that or even just imagining a favorite place or coping statements like it's normal to be nervous, but I will make it through today. Um, so these are a little bit like the present moment focus slide like, that I spoke about before. Another thing I often remind moms and parents is try to be a role model as much as possible. And I know that we're all doing this naturally as parents, but what I often say is that children learn to cope with stress and anxiety and any emotions really by directly observing the behavior of adults around them. So they pick everything up. Think of the toddler who hears everything and repeats everything. Your child is like this throughout their childhood, especially when they're managing stress and recognizing and realizing how to manage stress. Um, so if you are very stressed or you are struggling to manage some of the stress, don't beat yourself up about it, of course, but Try to manage the strong emotions when the children are there. Talk to children about stress, but more importantly, talk to them about what you can do to manage stress. 
So you can explicitly say, I'm feeling a bit stressed right now, so I'm going to have 10 minutes with my book, or I'm going to have 10 minutes outside, or I'm going to go for a little walk to calm down. So the children can learn, okay, how does my mom manage her emotions? What can I do to manage mine? And I think that's, that's a good thing just to keep in mind. And finally, there are just a few things that I would suggest for, for some of the mums just to maintain family resilience in general and um, throughout the whole, the whole current times and not just during the return to school. So of course, always as a mum, hold self-compassion for yourself. If you do feel stressed, anxious, or even quite low, give yourself a break. Do not beat yourself up about this because a lot of people are concerned about the return to school and a lot of people have struggled. We've been so busy as psychologists and mental health professionals. And I think that recognizing that this year has been difficult for so many people is a key thing to being self-compassionate. So don't beat yourself up if you have struggled this year because I think it's completely normal and acceptable. Another thing I've told a lot of people who are anxious at the moment is to change the conversation. Let your friends or family or colleagues know, actually, I would prefer not to talk about coronavirus today or can we talk about something else? Or, you know, just suggest that let's not talk about it today or let's talk about something else. Um, because some people really just not, do not enjoy the conversations about it, and that's fine. Um, but I would explicitly say, say that if that is the case. Um, remember as well that emotions can be contagious and just be mindful of the emotions around you, whether it's at home or at work, um, because we can quickly get sucked up into certain emotional states that are around us. And focus on facts. There's a lot of opinions, perspectives, and ideas about current things. And I think that if we just... Focus on the facts. That's a great way to, to move forward. Stay as connected as possible. You know, we humans really, really need and want social contact with others. Um, and loads of, you know, mental health research has shown the relationship between um, loneliness and mental health problems like depression and anxiety. So it's really, really essential that we stay as connected as possible to people. And if you can't do that in person or you're anxious about meeting physically, Try to schedule, you know, video calls, Zoom calls, and think of social contact as a vitamin for your mental health. You know, it really is essential at this time. And a lot of people have cited this as a big factor for their struggles this year, um, especially as the, as the lockdown and the restrictions were in place. Be mindful of your news consumption as a family as well and what impact that is having um, on the mental health within the family. A lot of people really love to, to catch up with the news and to look at the graphs and to understand the daily numbers and the daily figures. I have friends who often, you know, quote the, the daily figures from the DHA and the Dubai Health Authority on social media um, and also the impact that's having on our mental well-being. And just be careful and mindful of that as you move forward. Of course, if you know, people do want to get extra help, then by all means do it. Um, you can contact a psychologist to consider the next steps. Um, we at the Dubai Community Health Centre have um, offered free online consultations to people via Zoom. Um, if they are particularly stressed, and we've kind of had this in place since March, and lots of people have taken the offer up. So if you do think that would help you, of course, you know, feel free to get in touch. Um, there's lots of useful websites that I've used throughout my career, um, which are listed below. Um, Mind is a great one in the UK, and it has lots of different information about a range of mental health conditions, um, and it's really useful too. Some of the mums might want to look as well at my social media handle. Um, on my Instagram page, there's lots of different you know, tips and recommendations for managing different mental health conditions, and there's some videos as well on my IGTV. Um, for supporting your own mental health, but also children's mental health at this time. And that's it really. These are my contact details. If people do want to get in touch, if people want any resources at all, or if they have questions, or if I you know, suggested something within one of the slides and they want more information on that, feel free to get in touch. Um, we've got lots of different leaflets about a range of different mental health conditions for children and adults. Um, and people are welcome to ask for them if they want to. Some people prefer messaging on, on Instagram as well if they want to do that. 
And these are the clinic telephone number and website right here if people want to look further. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Paul. It's, it's very, a very useful um, lecture and session. Uh, I'm sure all mothers uh, have found it useful. Uh, I would li like to open the door for questions. So if anyone of the participants would like to ask Dr. Paul, you can uh, raise your hands. You can send your um, question on chat or just uh, uh, ask your questions. For me, I have one question. Uh, can we use the worry time with our uh, children and how can we introduce that to them? The yeah, worry time absolutely. technique, yes. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, the worry time is quite a useful thing because it explicitly outlines when we are permitted to worry. So it gives us control over the time we're spending worrying. So you can say to a child who worries excessively or who, you know, finds that they can't control their worries, you can just say something like, okay, you know, we worry quite a lot, so maybe we're going to spend some time giving ourselves permission to worry, and whether that's in a certain room, at a certain desk, whether it's at a certain time of the day, then you can explicitly say, or even use the timer and say, this is the start of our worry time, so we can talk about our worries right now, we can think about them and think about what might happen and think about solutions and discuss them with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And then when the alarm goes off, the worry time is finished. And then any other worries that come up throughout the day are moved to tomorrow's worry time. So you can do it every day or you can do it three times a week, for example. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is that you obviously give your child time to get used to the new kind of boundaries around worry. And um, you can know, give them a few weeks to get used to that but also encourage them and prompt them as much as possible. Okay, that's a new worry, let's save it for tomorrow. Let's move it to the next day. Let's try to keep that for tomorrow as much as possible. Okay. Uh, I see that Amal has raised her hand. Amal, you can uh, still ask your question. Uh, yes, hi, Dr. Paul. Hi. Uh, I loved, uh, I loved whatever, uh, what, everything you shared with us. It's very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, but uh, there's something I wanted to ask about. It's jumping to conclusions. Like my son always does that, especially with mind reading. So I, I was wondering, how can I help him stop doing that? And can I ask, him, who's your son? He's seven. He turned seven in July. But he always like tells me people uh, do this and people uh, did that to me. Oh, how did you know? He says, I know, I know. I you can't know. Did they say it to your face? He say, tells me no, but I know uh, what they mean and what they say. So I want to stop it. And I don't know how. So when you mentioned that, I said I have to ask you about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, I don't know your son personally, but I wonder, like, how would he act if this was you know, made a game or made something, made, made humorous in a way. Um, so, for example, sometimes, you know, with children who might present like this, we can say to them, you know, are you mind reading? Like, you know, and make it a character or make it like a robot or make it someone that he knows from like TV or YouTube or, or cartoons who might mind read or, or try, try that kind of um, approach and make it a joke or make it a character. Um, just so that he can um, kind of see that you know that's not always the correct way to be thinking and that's why when you make it a character you're making it a different way of thinking or an alternative way another good game is to and this is what I use with some children where you might have um, two cards for example so you can make these yourself at home and one would be like um, a factual card or I know this for sure and another one is like a mind reading card or I'm guessing um, and you can oh, say yeah. you can say different statements to your son and um, a very like a, a wide variety of them and he can hold up the, the handles depending on whether it's factual or whether it's mind reading or guessing and you can practice this game a few times a week just so that he can distinguish between these are actually facts or things that I'm sure of versus these are things that I'm guessing or mind reading. And you can take turns so that you can hold up the signs and he has to make up the statements or make up the stories. Or you can say, remember that time at the park or remember that incident at school? 
so that you can kind of use the cards in that manner as well. And that works really well with some kids. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you so much. Some, uh, they are asking about uh, if you are giving birth, uh, birth, personalized sessions. So I'm telling them that yes. And all your information are in the screen. They can call you or connect with you through email or uh, through your pages on Instagram and Facebook. So anyone who's interested in connecting later on with Dr. Ball, you can find his information in the screen. Uh, Amal, before taking your second questions, I go, I'm going to take uh, now as a question to, ke- to give room for more uh, people to ask. So yeah, Nauras, sure. you can Thank ask you. your uh, yes, you can ask your question. I, I, I hope uh, is my mic working? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you clearly. Okay, the the talk was very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, My question is, uh, what are the long-term effects on children's and teenagers' mental health of this isolation and uh, online uh, online learning and what we as mothers can do to ease these uh, uh, long-term effects? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's a lot of discussion and debate about the long-term impact of, of the restrictions and the lockdown. And I think, you know, really, there's no clear answer to this. It will vary from person to person. Um, and it will depend a lot on, you know, how isolated children are. You know, do they have siblings or not? Do they have access to cousins? You know, are their parents at home every day? Um, you know, how long were they in lockdown? But also, how did they cope as an individual with everything? Um, or how did their parents respond? There's a lot of different factors that are probably going to impact, you know, how how people have, you know, how people have felt and experienced the current times. And um, I think, to be honest, from a personal perspective, I'm hoping that it's not too much of a significant impact. And um, I think that, you know, parents and generally, you know, as a society, we've been very quick to be mindful of of the, the mental health impact. And we've you know been very careful to try to implement some of the you know the the strategies that you know support our mental well-being. And so things like you know making sure that children aren't exposed to news, have lots of downtime, have lots of social time, even if it's not in person, and are really good things that will sustain children's well-being during this time. And and I think that that's a key thing. Obviously, if there were children and there are children who have very, you know, clear anxiety symptoms as a result of what's happening, and they're the ones that have kind of stepped forward and come to sessions then. So hopefully they're being kind of protected in that sense. Um, And I think in that respect, hopefully, you know, the the impact is not too significant. Um, But again, it's nothing that we can't kind of support in a sense, you know, we're, we're all here and we're ready and willing to talk about mental health. We know the strategies that support people. Um, and I think if, if they do kind of, if they are showing themselves currently, then people are getting that help. And also if it comes up in the next year or two to three years, you know, we're all here to support that. So, you know, it's, it's nothing that we can't support really, which is, which is a good thing. Meanwhile, I, I have a question. If, if, if a kid is having uh, negative thoughts at night that prevents him from sleeping, that this, does this indicate anxiety and how can we uh, deal with it? Yeah, I mean, this is quite a common thing for adults and children alike. I think it, it could be a sign that they're anxious or they're worried. Mm-hmm. And finally, when the day is over, they've got time to think and that's when the worries come out. So, you know, you could just have a specific time of the day where the child talks about worries if they are concerned. One of the things that is always suggested for people like this is that they have to, it's a bit like the worry tree that I showed you earlier. So they have to actually explicitly say, what am I worried about? How can I get the worries out of my mind? Either like by journaling or writing them down or saying them verbally or discussing them for, you know, even three to five minutes with an adult. Um, and then leaving them aside and then trying like the relaxation technique or one of the, you know, the strategies to, to help us when we are worried, just so that we can, you know, follow that two-step process. The first bit being explicitly state the worries and kind of think with them for a few minutes and then let them go and actually use the relaxation technique mm-hmm. as much as possible. But I think that a child who 
if you're not sure whether they're anxious or not, and they're you know coming up with these thoughts in bed, they're probably likely to benefit from a space to talk about them, you know, throughout the different times of the day, rather than at the last minute when they go to bed. Thank you for your time, and we are looking forward for uh, the next session with you, inshallah. Ooh, thanks a lot for your time. No problem. You're very welcome. And like thanks. I said, feel free to get in touch if, if people have any questions or if something comes up later today. Yeah, or... and we, we, we most likely will share some of the uh, techniques you shared with us through our social media as well. No problem. Yes. Thank you.